sensed that um, the president acting on the bad advice of of a group of crank lawyers uh, that came into the White House in the days before January 6 is actually criminal. We had a goal to try to get to 40,000 in, in uh, just over 40 days, and we reached that today. These bad actors must be held accountable, and the, the criminal penalties should be significant. Hello, everyone. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. Former President Trump is staying defiant, of course, after receiving a target letter in the January 6th investigation. Trump hit the campaign trail in Iowa just after hours after posting that revelation about the target letter on social media. While speaking to voters in the Hawkeye state, the former president criticized investigators. CBS News has also learned more about the potential charges the former president could face. They include conspiracy to commit an offense or to defraud the U.S. Former President Trump is staying defiant, of course, after receiving a target letter in the January 6th investigation. Trump hit the campaign trail in Iowa just after hours after posting that revelation about the target letter on social media. While speaking to voters in the Hawkeye state, the former president criticized investigators. CBS News has also learned more about the potential charges the former president could face. They include conspiracy to commit an offense or to defraud the U.S. For more on all this, Finn Gomez and Scott McFarland join me now. Finn is CBS News' as political director. Scott is CBS News' congressional correspondent. Scott, I want to start with you on Capitol Hill, where you often are the person best able to take the temperature of revelations, either on the Hill or that interpose themselves on Capitol Hill. The target letter is one of those things interposing itself on the day-to-day -day business of Capitol Hill. What's the reaction so far, especially among Republicans? Well, if you walked around here with a microphone and a camera all day, you'd be asking a lot of questions about Donald Trump. And if you gave truth serum to everybody you were speaking with, they would say, can we talk about something else for a change? Republicans have not shifted their political support for Donald Trump, not one bit, after this news about the target letter. Ultimately, they're reinforcing the argument that they believe this is a weaponization of the government and the Justice Department by the Biden administration, hoping to take out their likely 2024 rival. Never mind the fact this is an independent special counsel who sent the target letter. Some of the language in the target letter really is resonating here among the president's critics. There is a sense in the language in the target letter that it's possible a charge of obstruction of an official proceeding could be one of the charges levied against Donald Trump. That is a charge the Department of Justice has brought 310 times by our CBS News count against January 6th defendants. There's quite a foundation for bringing that type of charge in this type of January 6th connected case. What's more, it's already gone through the appellate courts and been upheld. Feels like it's a strong foundation, and the president's critics say they expect an indictment, they expect it in short order, and they expect this case could have a size and scope that transcends the already quite large case filed in Miami. Finn, I want to talk to you about this phenomenon around the indictments and the rallying around the former president. There is a conversation that sometimes happens in dietary circles about a sugar high. Is there an indictment high that the former president's campaign is enjoying, meaning it's here and visible but may not last? I don't know. What do you hear? Uh, what I'm hearing is that, uh, yes, they believe that this uh, indictment high, if you will, will last, that they, they will build politically off of this. They already have. You're that it's durable. Point, and it, that it's durable, that it can be sustained. Um, you're also seeing, as, as we saw in the open, uh, that his rivals even remain somewhat tepid in their criticism, though it's sharpened a little bit. Uh, we saw you saw DeSantis in South Carolina saying that, uh, you know, he he that Trump should have acted more forcefully on January 6th. On January 6th, correct. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy even said he would have made different judgments to President Trump, and uh, Nikki Haley said that this is uh, dr this legal drama is drowning out like essentially the rest of the field. So you are seeing a lot, an uptick of that. However. Uh, you know, if you if you're talking to the talking to base voters, seeing the poll numbers, uh, Trump's trajectory uh, continues to go high in spite of this. And Scott, you talked to some Republicans, Lindsey Graham and J.D. Vance, both in the Senate about this. What did they have to say? Among the most fervent and loyal Trump supporters in the U.S. Senate are just those two. J.D. Vance, freshman senator from Ohio, Lindsey Graham, senior senator from South Carolina. They had a variety of defenses for Donald Trump and a variety of criticisms for this prosecution. Take a listen. You think Donald Trump can't get a fair trial in the District of Columbia? Why yeah. is that? Well, he got 5% of the vote. 
you can indict a Republican for almost anything and get convicted in this city. You know, there's places that Biden couldn't get a fair trial. So, yeah, I believe that. You don't think a jury can put the politics aside and no. say, hear the facts? No. If the special, pro special prosecutor is going to indict the former president and the likely leader of the opposition going into this presidential campaign, I think it suggests the Department of Justice has been completely politicized. We're also getting reaction from members of that House Select January 6th committee major. Jamie Raskin says that this target letter is further indication that nobody has laid a glove on the findings of that select committee and that it has been unimpeachable and untouchable, a work product that was produced by the committee and potentially used by the investigators at the special counsel's office. Then I want to ask you about this thing that is being presented to the American public and particularly Republican primary and caucus voters. January 6th was, we saw it on live television, the interference of an official congressional proceeding. Right. Fact. In, you can't dispute that. A congressional proceeding was delayed, therefore it was interfered with. There is now an effort by the special counsel possibly to hold the former president criminally accountable for that. He calls that election interference. Well, the delayed proceeding was about certifying an election. So if you're delaying a certifying election procedure, you're interfering with an election result. And yet this is being presented and all polling indicates Republican primary and caucus voters believe it and embrace that. That that dichotomy, that upside down logic. Now, you know, I think famously you remember Kellyanne Conway talking about alternate facts. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's like an alternate timeline, alternate uh, uh Dimension. Pers dimension perspective here from you from uh, the the MAGA base from what we're hearing the talking points we're hearing from the former president to Capitol Hill to the campaign trail that are that sounds like an echo chamber right major sounds the same uh, and and you're seeing it's the, there is that dichotomy dichotomy you speak of and, and it's it's this 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 alternate universe of facts frankly and and I, you know and it and it's permeating throughout the political landscape. And, uh, Scott, to your point a moment ago about truth serum, trust me, every Capitol Hill reporter wish, wishes they had vial upon vial of truth serum, but none, none exists. Do you consider, based on your interactions with these Republicans, this to be a genuine and, to use Finn's word, durable alliance with the former president or temporary and conditions-based, particularly legal conditions-based, as this plays out? been asking those questions to Republicans ever since January 6, 2021, more than 30 months, haven't noticed shifts, deviations, or any permeability to Republican support for Donald Trump in the bulk of those 30 months. It really does have staying power. And to your prior point, Major, not only was the official proceeding clearly obstructed January 6th, but this has all been litigated hundreds of times. Every single D.C. federal judge hearing a case has agreed, acknowledged there is proof beyond a reasonable doubt that there was an obstruction of an official proceeding that day. There's no wiggle room on that issue in this courthouse where presumably this case would go. And Finn, very quickly, do you anticipate that the former president will participate in the first Republican presidential debate next month? I would not be, I would not be surprised at all if he is not there. If he's not there. If he is not there, I would not be surprised. And that's the sort of sounding you get from the Trump inner circle. Right. He's up 30 points in most national polls. He's up high in uh, in the early state polling. Um, you know, why? 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 Why make himself a target? Why make himself a target? He doesn't have to. He's he's running basically as an incumbent right now, essentially within the Republican primary. So. And what about the ego dimension? There are all the other Republicans say his ego won't allow him not to be there. Uh, yeah, but I, at least comparable, uh, if you compare this time around to previous cycles, there's a little more discipline, I feel, uh, from his team, including, like, he has, you know, he has Chris LaCivita, he has Susie Wiles, some strong uh, folks there. I, I do not, but I do not, I do not expect him to be there. Finn Gomez, Scott McFarlane, we thank you. Several Republican candidates are rushing to qualify for that first GOP debate I just mentioned. North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum even offered gift cards for donations. He joins us next to discuss that costly and somewhat unique strategy and his potential path to the White House. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. One of the thresholds to qualify for the first Republican presidential debate next month is 40,000 unique donors. 
North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum has made some noise with his unorthodox strategy, giving $20 gift cards in exchange for new campaign donations, which can be as small as $1. North Dakota Governor and 2024 Republican presidential candidate Doug Burgum joins us now from Sioux City, Iowa. Governor, as I understand it, you have, as of today, qualified for the first Republican debate, achieving 40,000 unique donors. Is that true? Yeah, that's absolutely correct, Major. And I just want to give a big shout out of gratitude. Uh, we had a group early on called the Sodbusters, and this was friends and family, and they were they were hustling uh, within Within three and a half days, we had donations from all 50 states. Everybody was combing their their business contacts, their their uh, holiday card list uh, to try to just you know build the excitement from a grassroots uh, basis around that and, and business partners. So whether it's friends from high school, business partners from 30 years ago, uh, people I've met across, and a lot of people in the state of North Dakota, big thank you from Catherine and I for all the support. We had a goal to try to get to 40,000 and in uh, just over 40 days, and we reached that today. And, and again, just grateful for all, all the support and all the interest. And as I understand it, uh, some of those received $20 gift cards, correct? Yeah, absolutely, they did. And and anybody, uh, you know, I'm a, I, I grew up in a small town in North Dakota, and, and uh, farming uh, was my background, but I spent most of my years in tech and software tech specifically. And everybody knows that anybody's ever opened up an online business uh, when you when nobody knows you and you're getting started, you you know you put a product out there and you offer it for a discount and try to get people to know who you are and what kind of service you provide and and so we uh, we did have a promotional officer office or offer it's still on uh, so there if people haven't gotten their twenty dollar gift card we're happy to do that but I just want to say again that say there's plenty of rackets in in uh, politics and one of them is the uh, online companies that can charge upwards of a hundred dollars to acquire a donor. Uh, we figured out a way to uh, do that at about one tenth the price because not everybody wants a gift card. Some people are happy to give, and a lot of people give more than a dollar. But if you give a dollar, and uh, just to help us see on the debate stage, we uh, we send you a gift card to help help offset the inflation that they've experienced under the Biden administration. And they can use it to purchase gas or have your whole family send in a donation, and uh, you know then get enough cards you can take your family out to dinner. Right. Do you have any idea, Governor, what percentage of those 40,000 received or will receive gift cards? Well, I've been on the road today in Iowa, so I, I don't know the, uh, the the number, but we did commit uh, that we would give away up to 50,000 of those. And so uh, if people haven't got one yet, they can still go there and still get one today. We'll be happy to blow past the 40,000 level. We'd rather, uh, you know, be giving a uh, uh, something back to our supporters than, uh, you know, giving it to some, you know, big tech online fundraising company. Right. And as I understand it, you're self-financing. So essentially they're getting money directly from you. No, I'm not self-financing. I don't I know why that uh, keeps being repeated all the time, but this is going to be, we'll have a fully financed campaign, but in this day and age, the only way this works is if people believe in you. Uh, I've always put some of my own money in every startup I've ever been in. I literally, literally, my dad passed away when I was a freshman in high school, got a bit of farm ground. I literally mortgaged that to be the seed capital for the first software company I was involved with, Great Plains Software. But just like Great Plains and everything I've ever done, we've had outside investors and we've got people that have been very generously stepping up here in the early part of the campaign to support what we're doing. Is there anything from your vantage point, Governor, that is even nominally absurd is probably too strong a word, but distracting about this 40,000 donor threshold that the Republican National Committee has established to get on the debate stage? Couldn't you be spending your time and efforts better? Well, absolutely. The good news is I haven't had to spend much time on it because we had a, I'd say, a good, you know, entrepreneurial uh, approach to you know solving this problem, and we just said, hey, it's it's a checkbox. We'll check it. But yeah, it's kind of, it's a goofy rule, and it's a goofy rule because it you know it favors people that have you know held national office. It favors people that are from large states. It uh, it you know really is against uh, people that might have uh, the right kind of qualities but are less well known. And so uh, again, it's a it's a form of uh, limiting competition and limiting fresh ideas. I think competition is great for the Republican Party. And I, you know, if some people think that, you know, 12 people is too many, like, oh, it's a crowded field. It's like, hey, you know, when I was a chairman or CEO, if we posted for a job and only 12 people uh, submitted resumes and some of them weren't even qualified, 
you know, we'd probably look at each other and say, we better repost because we want to get, you know, 30, 50 or 100 candidates. So it's it's one of the absurdities of American politics that somehow, you know, people think these fields are crowded when it's the most important job in the world. And, and I said, I think competition is what America has been built on. So we're, yeah, but, you know, we'll check the box. We'll be on the debate stage and we're going to keep keep charging going forward. We didn't spend a lot of time sweating this one. We've been focused on the issues that matter most to uh, the American public. And that's the uh, economy, energy, national security. And we talk about that at every stop. You mentioned qualifications. Are you more qualified than President Trump? Well, I, I'm not going to make a judgment. That's up to the American voters are going to have to decide. We have to make our case. Uh, but I think, you know, someone who's got a background as a governor, I understand what federal overreach looks at looks like because I've been on the receiving end. But I've also been a small business owner and I know what it's like to, you know, cut your own salary to make sure you can make payroll. And I've also, you know, led global businesses. And I understand that we're in competition directly with uh, China, the number two economy in the world, is trying to overtake us. We're in a cold war with China. Uh, we're in a, a, a we're in really in at war with Russia. We just haven't sent troops yet. And so we've got a very unstable world driven by both economic and energy policies that are that are uh, not just off track. They're 180 degrees in the wrong direction as governor of a state that's one of the largest food producing and one of the largest energy producing states in the nation. I understand a lot about the global economy, and I understand how to take cost out. In North Dakota, we took $1.7 billion out of a $6 billion budget uh, and ended up delivering better services to the, to the public because there's never been anybody with a software technology uh, business process improvement background uh, that's ever run for this office. And, and when we've got 2 million federal employees, having somebody that knows how to take cost out and provide better services, yeah, I'd say that's a great qualification. Is there anything that former President Trump has done from your perspective, Governor, that disqualifies him from the presidency a second time? Well, I think, again, uh, everybody's innocent until they're proven guilty. There's been lots of acquisition, ac accusations being kicked around. Uh, and But I think, again, it's up to the public. That's why we have elections. I mean, this is a... You know, Super Bowl is not till next February. And I, I, I have, there's like a whole industry of pundits that's trying to figure out, you know, that the game's already over and they already know who the two players are going to be in the game. And and the season hasn't even started yet. I mean, elections start next January. So, uh, this, uh, you know, the voters of America are going to have a chance to weigh in next January and February and the primary start. And they'll have the information they need that time to make a decision on who's in the best position to beat Joe Biden. And that's the case that we're going to keep making for the American public. And you will not make the case, as you make your case for yourself, Governor, that the former president has already disqualified himself from the office. Well, again, I, there's plenty of uh, like there's an entire industry built around that question. And uh, I, you know, whether it's clickbait or cable news, I mean, you know, have at it. Governor Doug Burgum, thanks for the time and safe travels. Thank you, Major. Great to be on with you. The first felony charges in a fake elector's plot came down in Michigan this week. Coming up, we'll speak to the state's Secretary of State about that case. You are streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. 16 Michigan residents are facing felony charges for falsely claiming to be presidential electors for former President Trump after he lost the 2020 election. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel announced all of that Tuesday. Each of the 16th alleged false electors have been charged with eight felony counts. Joining us now is Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Madam Secretary, why did it take so long for these charges to manifest? All the material facts have been known for more than two years. Well, I think the attorney general's investigation was meticulous. It was fact-driven. And it was mindful of this moment that we're in where things, particularly with regards to law enforcement around violations of election law pertaining to the 2020 election, have become overly politicized. So it was really important here that she proceed carefully, judiciously, and her investigators did so. And when they were ready to issue an indictment, I think there was also a question of what was the right move in this challenging political environment. And ultimately, it, it appears she decided that the, the most political thing for her to do would be to not proceed with charges when there was overwhelming evidence of guilt. And so she proceeded with charges. And I think the investigation is still ongoing and may also reveal additional violations in the future. From your vantage point, Madam Secretary, do you believe Michigan will be the only state to so charge its residents for submitting fraudulent electoral slates? 
Well, we were not the we were not the only state to be inundated with false electors trying to uh, falsely claim to the federal government that they were the duly elected electors from the state. We know Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and several other states were were uh, part of this scheme as well. So I don't think we should be surprised. And then we know the Attorney General of Arizona, Chris Mays, has already said she's investigating the incident in her state. We shouldn't be surprised if we see other indictments follow. But I presume that if they do, they will be similarly in accordance with the law and the facts of the case and will proceed accordingly to ensure that justice is served where it needs to be served. Do you believe this is, or these cases and these sets of facts are better prosecuted at the state level or the federal level? Interestingly, it's kind of two parallel tracks because the violations that happened here in Michigan that pertain to Michigan law, uh, the victims of this crime were Michigan voters, the millions of Michigan voters who voted in Michigan's election and deserve to have their voices heard and their votes certified and their duly elected electors represent them. Uh, so noting that there's a role to play for the states in protecting their voters. But when you have what appears to be a nationally coordinated effort to defraud voters in many states, there needs to be a federal component as well. And so it's no surprise to me that we're seeing both proceed, but both must proceed if we're truly going to see consequences for the unprecedented effort to try to undermine the will of the voters in a legitimate presidential election. Madam Secretary, do you believe these charges will have a deterrent effect as we head toward 2024? I'm hopeful. Uh, they, they certainly should, because we want to send a clear message to anyone, anywhere, on any side of the aisle, thinking of trying to undermine election results simply because they disagree with them, that that is not what we do in America, that is not what the law allows. And when anyone tries to interfere with the voices and votes of eligible voters, we will be there to ensure justice is served. And that's what these indictments ultimately underscore and the message that they send to anyone thinking of future shenanigans in 2024 or beyond. You mentioned, Madam Secretary, that these charges are meant to protect those voters who were harmed by this maneuver. I wonder if you have a perspective on that some of those voters who were harmed may well have been Trump voters who legitimately supported the former president, but would not want to be associated with anything to defraud the actual ultimate result, meaning they could be unhappy with the result, but don't want to be defrauded by anyone. Yes, indeed, that is democracy. Sometimes we win elections, sometimes we lose elections, but we stand by the results and the will of the people. And it's been notable that so many Republican voters and Republican leaders in Michigan have, uh, at the time and in the weeks and months since, uh, disavowed a connection to this uh, plan or have in many ways criticized it because it's not what Republican voters deserve either. We all deserve to live in a democracy where whoever wins, uh, that that is the will of the voters and it is respected and supported by everyone, even if you disagree with the results. So I hope all voters can see this is an act of protection for every citizen in our state to make sure that no matter who they vote for or who they support, that the winner, the right and duly elected winner of an election is the one who we will legally be bound to support. I have seen, Madam Secretary, some defense of this false elector scheme in the sense that, well, there were legitimate questions being raised and the submission of false electors can't be regarded as a crime if in the minds of those who submitted them, they were uncertain of the actual outcome. Your reaction? Well, notably, the signing of the false slate occurred after the legal system had been exhausted in Michigan. There were dozens of cases filed, determined meritless and evidenceless, evidenceless and dismissed. Uh, there were legislative hearings that failed to produce any credible shred of evidence of any type of uh, wrongdoing or inaccuracy in our elections. There were also audits that occurred after the certification of the election that again reaffirmed the accuracy of the results. So in many ways, this was almost a last ditch effort of what was a multifaceted attempt to try to undermine and overturn a duly legitimate election. Uh, and that said, uh, many people knowingly went into that, mayors, co-chair of the Republican Party, entered into the basement of the Republican Party headquarters and signed these pieces of paper. And there's plenty of evidence, I think, to suggest that's already been made public, that they fully knew what they were doing, lying to the federal government uh, to falsely state they were electors of the state. And when that happens, there needs to be accountability to ensure that this isn't attempted again. Michigan Secretary